This is November 30th, 2010. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm here to interview Tony Hilliard, who has kindly agreed to come and tell us about his, his life and his experiences in the military as far as in connection with the Veterans History Project. Uh, Tony, we really appreciate you coming in here today and look forward to hearing your story. Would you give us uh, your complete name your current address and your date of birth. Uh, I am Anthony Stephen Hilliard. My current address is Tucker, Georgia, mm -hmm. and uh, I was born in uh, November of 1944, so I'm the ripe old age of 66. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. I uh, was born in Philadelphia. I uh, was an only child. My extended family was rather large. It was an Italian family and I had many, many cousins and aunts and uncles. Um, grew up, uh, went to a, a Catholic parochial school, went to an all-male Catholic high school, and that was followed by uh, a uh, four years at LaSalle College, which was a Christian brother all-male Catholic college. And did your family have a military background of any kind? No. Uh, actually, I had some uncles who served in World War II, but my father was too old to serve in World War II. And uh, I, I was really the only one in, in uh, I guess, my generation who actually went into the service. When you went into the service, were you drafted or did you join up voluntarily? I, uh, I joined the Marine Corps. Uh, I was, when I was a sophomore in college, I went down to the recruiting office and the Marine Corps, the way the Marine Corps recruits officers, their officer programs, uh, you go to what is known as the PLC program, platoon leaders class, and uh, you can either do uh, two summers, two consecutive summers in your, uh, during your, co your four year college career, or you can do it in one summer. And that's what I did the summer between my junior and senior years. I spent 10 weeks at Quantico, which is essentially an officer screening process, the platoon leaders class. How'd your family feel about you going in? Mixed emotions. Uh, my mother didn't, didn't think it was really all that great an idea. Uh, and the rest of the folks, uh, this was again 1965, 1966. Uh, there really wasn't anything big on the horizon. and, and uh, it was just kind of because of all the experience with the uncles and other family members, it was, it was okay. It was kind of the thing to do. Nobody thought much of it. How did your friends feel about it when you told them you were joining the Marines? You know, everybody gives you the look, you're, what? What are you going to do? What are you going to do that for? Uh, but I, I just, you know, it's something that I wanted to do, and, and uh, the Marines had always impressed me. So I, I went ahead and did it, and I was commissioned uh, when I graduated from college. When did you go in? When went in, into the service? Exactly well, the, the, the actual, the 10 weeks at uh, PLCs was uh, actually counted as uh, service time. I held the, the steam rank of corporal for 10 weeks. Okay. And uh, then when I got commissioned in June of 1966, I became a second lieutenant. Talk about some of your experiences at PLC. What, what you Ooh. remember about it that was... Specific. I remember the OSO, the officer selection officer, saying you guys have to be in shape. So I, you know, I was a city boy. We uh -huh. did a lot of running and uh, uh, in preparation did sit-ups and push-ups and things like that. Was not at all prepared for uh, the, the training regimen down there. The, uh, the PLC program is essentially a screening process and uh, I remember the first run, the first platoon run we went on. It wasn't very long, but Quantico was kind of a rolling hill uh, terrain. And uh, I guess about halfway through, I just I thought I was going to die, and I fell <laughs> out. Death would have been welcomed compared to the <laughs> to the treatment I got after having fallen out. So never again. I mean, I just never again fell out. That's just the way it was. You know, you learn quickly. Did you lose many other? We did people? actually. Uh, one of the scary things was uh, we were living in wooden frame barracks at Quantico down by the railroad tracks, between the railroad tracks and the river. Uh, it wasn't an idyllic setting, but uh, the, the first day 
were being yelled at and we were on the the second deck of a building and we'd go up these stairs and in into the the squad bay I mean it was just cots or racks the length of the uh, um, the room and uh, we're all filing in and we're told to stand by a rack so we're standing by a rack one of the guys comes in and looks around and says that's it I'm out of here and you could I mean that's it was called DNR disenrollment on request or DOR and uh, everybody you could hear eyeballs clucking up and down thinking what is this going to be like if the guy didn't make the you know <laughs> just just the entry into the uh, into the, the the squad bay so that was the beginning a lot of guys dropped out about I guess a third of the class dropped out hmm. was there a lot of conversation about Vietnam among the your fellow there soldiers was, there was only one indication that something was happening we had been there probably about eight weeks and the, the company commander came in and he was it was kind of a training session and he kind of made an offhand comment about uh, the way things were going and we're probably all going to be involved soon and everybody just kind of looked at each other had no idea what he was talking about and uh, that was it I mean uh, through the next year my senior year I remember I went my the summer between my junior and senior years next year I was a senior focused on graduating and it still didn't register. It didn't register until after I was commissioned and uh, went to the basic school back down at Quantico, which was really a training program for officers. And there was a lot of discussion because a lot of the instructors had been, uh, yeah. uh, had service in Vietnam at the time. Were you fairly sure that you were going to go to Vietnam? Oh, we knew we were all gone. Okay. There wasn't any question about it. When did you get orders to go to Vietnam? I was, I was fortunate because my first duty station uh, after leaving the basic school, I was assigned to the 2nd Engineer Battalion. That was my MOS. I was a combat engineer. I was assigned to the 2nd Engineer Battalion in, uh, down at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And uh, that was probably a good thing for me. I had a platoon sergeant who was a, a Vietnam veteran, young E5, uh, Sergeant Adams, good man, taught me a lot. He knew I was going and uh, a lot of the people in the platoon were returnees. So I, I did a year there and uh, I, I found out I was the officer of the day. I was the battalion officer of the day and the S3 sticks his head in the door and says, well, how do you feel about leaving? And I just kind of looked at him and he knew I had no idea what he was talking about. And uh, then he told me and I, you know, I think he felt bad about it, but I, I just, you know, I was excited about it. You know, I, was, I was getting to go. And uh, I called my wife after he left. And I called my wife and said, hey, you know, I'm going. And uh, we had been married less than a year. And uh, there was this pregnant pause. Yeah. And then she started firing questions at me. You know, and I, I couldn't answer them. But yeah. Uh, yeah. I was ready. So when did you ship out? I left on January 3rd, 1968. I was fortunate because I got to spend Christmas at home. Yeah. And uh, I had a great time. But I, I, as I tell other people, you know, everybody else, the holiday was kind of passed with a stiff upper lip. Yeah. And uh, I left, I, I, was, I was due to report to Travis, I think on January 3rd. Being young and foolish, I left January 2nd because I didn't want to be late. So <laughs> I got out there and uh, I had half a day to kill, so I, you know, got a room in a motel and just kind of hung around and, and went out to Travis the next day and uh, got there about midday or maybe late morning, something like that. But the flight wasn't heading out until that evening, so I went to the PX and killed some time and went over to the the Air Force Officers Club at Travis. And I ran into this uh, Navy Lieutenant JG who's actually on the same flight. So we just sat there and drank beer for most of the day, and we were we weren't feeling any pain by the time we, <laughs> you know we had to manifest and board the plane, but uh, it was okay. You know, the flight over was well. We didn't we didn't go directly in the country. We went to Okinawa. All Marines passed through Okinawa for processing. Then we got to Okinawa. Well, I I was a first lieutenant. So I, I, because that year I spent in the States, so I was the senior guy on the flight over. Huh. So, uh, you know, I had no idea what that meant other than if something went wrong, you know, I was going to be responsible. But 
we flew over there and got to Okinawa and then everybody got off and uh, the officers were taken up to uh, I believe it was Camp Schwab up in north up in the northern part of the island that was the processing center everybody went up to Schwab but uh, went up there and uh, got off the bus and you know you're groggy after however many hours it is and, and uh, they got, I got assigned a BOQ room, so I had a C bag, a duffel bag, and I had a B4 bag, which is, you know, the military suitcase, that cloth military suitcase. And the standard, what I was told, the standard was you had two to three days to process before you went in country, also known as down south. And uh, so I get, the, get in the BOQ room, was nobody there but me, so I take everything out. I took all my stuff out of my C bag, out of my B4 bag. And I put it in piles, you know, because I was going to have to leave for some reason. You had to take your dress uniforms with you, which made no sense at all. But I had them with me, so I put all that stuff in a pile. That was going to go into storage and had on my field uniform. It's all over the floor and the bed and everything. I thought, well, I got three days. You know, I went out, had some chow, went out in town, had a couple beers in Kin Village, which was kind of a notorious liberty spot. And I came rolling back in about 11 o'clock, and there's a note under the door and it says call the officer of the day call the OD as soon as you get in. So I called the OD and he said you're going on the first flight tomorrow morning. So, Good gosh. Oh man. So I spent most of the night sorting through all the stuff I had to, to sort through and got everything that I was leaving on Okinawa in the bag and then checked that in, woke up the supply guy at like two or three in the morning and checked that in and uh, uh, got the rest of the stuff together and put it in my sea bag and had it all packed and everything. I finished in time for breakfast and then got on the bus and went to Kadena Air Force Base for the for the flight over and uh, got to Kadena. There I was, the senior officer, <laughs> plane full of uh, you know mostly enlisted guys heading heading over to Vietnam and uh, the only upside there was you know. Nobody, there was no lighthearted banter. It was, everybody was pretty quiet, yeah. you know, and, and we flew over there. And the only upside for me was I was sitting in the first seat. And uh, as we, after we, it's only, it was only a couple hours down from Okinawa. So I, um, uh, the pilot came out about an hour, maybe, an, uh, maybe 45 minutes from uh, Da Nang. And he said, you want to come up front? So I went up and sat in the cockpit and chit-chatted with the, the pilot and the co-pilot and, you know, passed the time a little bit and he said, well, we're getting ready to land, so you need to go back. And I went back and sat down and, you know, there we were, touchdown and, you know, everybody's, you know that feeling, you're just waiting. They popped the door open and just warm or hot, humid air, just whoosh, you know, and we had arrived. What was your first impression? as you got off the plane? It was how big Da Nang Airfield was. It was huge. Uh, uh, not, not full of amenities, it was a military airfield, but it was just huge. Just the size of it amazed me. And they rolled the, the, the stairway up and we got down and the officers went one direction. They had a formation, got the troops together and marched them. Uh, into the, the, the processing area and uh, one of the <laughs> there was a pen uh, not far from where the, the plane stopped and it was the folks that were going to take our seats to go back and uh, it was at the time it wasn't amusing but I mean that you could hear the cat calls and <laughs> you'll be sorry and, you know, and we're walking the officers kind of meandered on their own and this formation of troops is going by and these guys are the guys in the pen are having a grand old time, you know, <laughs> what a welcome. <laughs> but uh, So they got us where we were, you know, together, where we were supposed to be, and, and uh, they knew, you know, where our next destination was, which was just further processing. And uh, I, I was assigned to the 1st Marine Division, so I went up to, uh, um, with some other guys in a, in a Jeep or a small truck, I don't remember what it was, but we went up to Hill 327, which was where the division headquarters was, where the Da Nang PX was. It was also on the back side of the hill. When you see Bob Hope doing the USO show at Da Nang, that's where he did it. 
at uh, the Hill 327. So we got up there, and you know, you're the new guy. You you don't know where anything yeah. is, and people tell you do this, do that. So they sent me down to um, the transient officers BOQ, which was essentially a strong back hut, and I dropped my gear on the on a cot, and then I had to go do paperwork. And it was it was probably mid afternoon about that time, so I got some of that stuff done and got chow and uh, you know just trying to acclimate, trying to get comfortable with my surroundings. And uh, I went to, went to sleep. Uh, the three twenty the hill three twenty seven it's three hundred twenty seven feet high, and uh, the the transient BOQ was probably it was up there away. So you had a pretty good view of the airfield, and, and I mean it wasn't very far from the airfield. I went to sleep, and about two thirty three o'clock in the morning, you just hear these explosions, and everybody sits up, and, and we're looking out, and this, the screens on the side of this thing, and the Danang airfield is is under rocket attack. And uh, it was, it was just like in the movies. I mean, it, we're sitting there, and you just see these yellow flashes in the distance, and they would, they would light up the revetments or the aircraft that were in the area. There were probably only six or seven impacts, you know, 122 rockets, and then it just got dark and quiet, and uh, huh. went back to sleep. But what was your feeling when you saw that? Wow, I mean, it was. It, it was surreal. It was it was it was like watching it in a movie, because you know the dis excuse me the distance and uh, it just you know I went back to sleep. But it, it was I I knew where I was. I mean we we you are now in the theater. You know this is yeah. the way it is. Yeah. And uh, it didn't it didn't bother me too much because like I said it was almost unreal. It was you know like yeah. part of a show. Yeah. And uh, the next morning, more processing. And uh, since I was an engineer, I had to visit with the, uh, the division engineer, and he made the assignments to the inbound officers. And uh, on my way to uh, Vietnam, when I left Philadelphia, or I'm sorry, when I left Camp Lejeune, before I went on my uh, pre-deployment leave, I went to the Civil Affairs School in Fort Gordon, Georgia was a quota filler and uh, you know they just snap up people who were going and yeah. you're going to civil affairs school so he said hey you've gone to civil affairs school you want to be a civil affairs officer and I said well I'd rather go out to an engineer unit and he said okay all right you're going to 7th engineer battalion at Camp Love I said, sounds good to me I had no idea what that meant yeah. you know it sounded good to me yeah. so I went down there and, and uh, after, once I knew where I was going. I had to go by the G3 and uh, had to read the rules of engagement. And, what, and I remember to this day, the, the clerk who gave me the rules gave me these two three-ring binders that were maybe about four to six inches. I just know they were big. And, you know, there were just reams of paper in there. And you had to, you were supposed to read and acknowledge having read the rules of engagement. Well, after about an hour, I was only about a third through one of them. And I mean, and they were talking about details. If this set of conditions exist, you know, these are the rules of engagement. And, uh, you know, I, I, I thought, I'm never, you know, what, I'm wasting my time. I'll never remember this. So I, I spent a few more minutes and just kind of thumbed through it and decided that if, if I ever got in a situation where I had to be concerned about that, I'd just do what I thought was right and then, you know, take my chances with that. So I signed the form and uh, turned it in and uh, that was the end of my check-in at Division and I spent one more night at, in, on Hill 327 and then uh, the next morning rode a truck out to Camp Love which was down by I don't know, Red Beach and the Force Logistics Command uh, which is on the northern outskirts of Da Nang. And uh, I got there, and once again, you're into the paper business of checking in and drawing equipment and things like that. One of the most memorable things about my arrival was I got there in the early afternoon, and somebody took me into the club for beer, and I could not believe this club. It was made out of bridge timbers and stone and cement. 
big mahogany bar that somebody had gotten to fill in. <laughs> am I in the Air Force? You know, where am I? But I thought, this is cool. You know, I like this. And uh, every, every no, I was there for three nights, two or three nights, and had a beer there every night, and, you know, thinking good things. But it was, it was typical check in, draw your weapon, draw your. The only, what made me stand out was I was wearing, in, in the Marine Corps, the field uniform was called a utility uniform. And we were wearing cotton, the, the new guys coming in wearing cotton things, no camouflage utility, so you stood out like a sore thumb. And uh, uh, I was fortunate enough when I was in supply to get a couple of pairs of uh, um, jungle utilities that uh, somebody had had to leave and left his, uh, his Clothing, they they were my size, so I got to wear them. So I, I got to blend in fairly quickly. But uh, some of my compatriots looked like newbies for a while, <laughs> and uh, so I got all that done. And uh, next morning early, uh, got on the truck and drove out to. Uh, I was assigned to Delta Company. Oh, the battalion commander was really a cool guy, uh, really very friendly. Um, made me feel welcome to be in the battalion. I mean, genuinely felt like, you know, he was glad I was there and uh, told me I was going out to Delta Company, which was uh, out on Hill 37, a town called Dialock, about 20 miles southwest of Da Nang. And uh, he said, you know, you're going out there to relieve Lieutenant Cullinan, who was killed yesterday. And, uh, you know, everything was great to that point. And uh, I, he didn't do that, I don't believe, intentionally. He was just stating a fact. But, you know, the, the old pucker factor yeah. got, it, it all became serious at that point. And, uh, but I still, he, he, uh, he didn't minimize it, but he, he, uh, he made me feel confident that I could do whatever had to be done. And uh, he said, that's it, I'll see you. And uh, the next morning I got the truck and drove out to Delta Company, which was an experience, you know, driving through the countryside and, you know, water buffalo and rice paddies and villages and little kids with no bottoms running around, you know, and the smells and, and uh, uh, it just sucked it all in. Yeah. And, uh, and I got out there and uh, I guess I got out there late morning and 20, 20 uh, miles wasn't that great a distance to cover. The roads were all dirt. I mean, it was, but I mean, this guy was moving along to get there. And Delta Company was, was pretty secure. Uh, our engineer company shared the hill with uh, the 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, an infantry battalion. And there was tuna tanks up there and some Amtrak. So, I mean, then there was a, a, a large uh, combat presence in the area. And, uh, you know, I got there, I met the, uh, the CO, uh, Captain Tony Lopez, who I met later on, good man, uh, welcomed me aboard and told me my job was to learn for the next few days. I wasn't allowed to do anything but listen, and, which was a smart thing to do. Um, there should have been four platoons in the company. Uh, there was one located at, at the company CP. It was one down at a place called Anwa, which was even further southwest. That was de that was the second platoon. That's the platoon I was going to get, but I wasn't going down there until I had at least a week on the road with one of the other platoon, the only other platoon that was back there. Um, the uh, the other platoon leader was Denny Pease. Now the other two platoons were somewhere else. I don't remember where they were, but they were out somewhere. And that's what I did for the first week. I just followed him. Uh, we were in the mine clearance business. That's what we did. And uh, he, his platoon was an experienced, um, very good clearing sweep team. I mean, they, they had been together uh, a, a fair amount of time. They knew what they were doing. Their platoon sergeant was a young, uh, E5 named uh, Sergeant Hollingsworth looked like the all-American boy. Blonde hair, was kind of curly. Um, he carried a silver, a nickel-plated six-shooter on his hip. But he was, he had, he had, um, not re-enlisted. Uh, 
what do they call it when you re up re up yeah. or to stay in country yeah, you know extended yeah. Yeah. extended for three yeah. tours so he had been there I guess over 24 months when I saw him. and the reason he did that he didn't want to go back to the states because we we're starting to hear the stuff about any war protesters mm -hmm. and he certainly didn't want to be in the stateside military establishment yeah. you know after having been pretty much the guy who ran his platoon yeah. so he liked it to stay good man very knowledgeable cared about the people in his platoon and uh, so I, you know they would go out I would be with Denny the platoon leader and I would watch them how they operated and uh, typical new guy he, Denny always said if you if something doesn't look right stop and ask a question so and I'm from the city okay mm -hmm. Then we're walking down the road and there's this cow pie in the middle of the road. And I said, Danny, could there be a booby trap under that? And he looks at me and, you know, after having said, you need to check everything out, he said, we'll check it out. So he tapped some young Lance Corp and he said, check that out. <laughs> the kid just looked at him and he looked at me and, uh, Stuck his bayonet in and, and just kind of, like, you know, where, you know, who is this guy? <laughs> so the lesson learned was, you know, use a little bit of common sense when you're out there doing this stuff. But I learned a lot. You know, it, it was a good experience. And uh, well, describe the the process for clearing mines in, in your area. Um, it was pretty much standard in in this part of the country. Uh, in our in this part of the AOR, the, the area of responsibility, the roads were prim were dirt. I mean, there was no hard surface road in this in this area. Um, so you had two men forward who had mine detectors, and uh, the state of the art of mine detectors was not very good. I mean, they were they were designed to detect metal, and we were we never experienced any. Metal mine. The only thing, the only metal component that we ever discovered was a fuse that was about the size of my thumb. So it became more of an art than a science. Where the, the the sweeper would be, and the other thing was the tone in the ears. You couldn't, after a certain point, you you couldn't distinguish the difference in tone. So you had to change off fairly rapidly, or, or on, you know, on a, on a fairly frequent basis. Um, and it became more of an art that where you would the guys would be looking, but they could actually they might be able to tell if the road surface was disturbed, and that was usually the first indicator. And then it'd be more attentive. But I mean, essentially, you're just walking down the road, swinging this detector over an arc and trying to pick up a change in tone. That you know, it, it, the state of the art just just wasn't that good. So we that's. Where they that was a fairly secure area where his platoon was, and uh, I spent the week and then uh, flew down to Anwa. The the uh, Anwa was a combat base um, that had a a, uh, a matted airfield, an AM2 matted airfield. The uh, the road down to Anwa, after a certain point, once you crossed a river, was Indian country. I mean, you couldn't drive down there. This was early 1968, too, so things were starting to get exciting. So I flew down on the helicopter and met the, there was a gunnery sergeant who was in a camp to caretaker status for the platoon because the lieutenant had been killed. And uh, he kind of showed me around and I became Delta II actual at that time and uh, the, the troops, you know, it's a typical feeling out process. Who is this guy and, you know, who are they and, and uh, they were fairly savvy. The, my platoon sergeant was a corporal who, uh, the, the unit down there was kind of a mixed bag because the, the Anwar combat base was located where it was because uh, the, the U.S. government, the Vietnamese government wanted to uh, develop an economic, uh, an industrial area. And you could actually see uh, some of the, the buildings were preformed concrete. They were building an industrial complex, complex about 500 yards from this Anwar combat base. Well, 
the NBA and DC didn't think that was a good idea. So, I mean, you couldn't get traffic down there, it just got shut off. But our job was to try to develop that road between Da Nang and Anwa so that, you know, materials could flow and uh, they could develop this because it was essentially an agricultural area. Um, and there was a rock crusher down there that was a beast. It was, oh, it had been blown up on the way out there and, and uh, the idea was, you know, there was a quarry that'd bring rocks, the rocks would be crushed, would take them out on the road, lay them, and then, you know, try to, it wasn't going to be hard surface, but it was going to be, you know, pushed down in and, and um, make it a, a fairly uh, hard surface natural road, if that's the right term. Um, so I was the OIC of this composite unit. There were 12 combat engineers, and I think there were there were like three heavy equipment operators and, and maybe four or five dump truck operators. That was it. That's that's who we were. But we were down there with uh, an artillery battery, another platoon of tanks. Uh, it was a reinforced infantry company. It was, you know, to secure that, that area. And uh, the Duck Duck District headquarters was right outside the gate. So there was a, a U.S. and Vietnamese government presence in the area. And uh, we started the road that we swept. Um, was it, it the condition of the road varied as you left the base? It was fairly in fairly decent shape because it was under the watch of the security forces out of Anwa. And our sweep was about I want to say nine, ten kilometers. We would sweep north to catch another sweep team coming south. And when they met, the road was declared open, and you know, technically it was okay to travel on that road. Um, it, it, the road was in various states of, of completion. The best way to describe some of it was if, if you look at a cobblestone street, if you picture in your mind a cobblestone street, picture it without the binder. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've dumped rocks out there and they're laying there, but we haven't had time to get the equipment out there to do something with it. And then the further out you went, the less prepared it was. It was just dirt and uh, um, so it, it, you know, you never knew what was going to happen in the mine detectors. It, that's really when it became an art because the mine detectors just weren't that helpful. Did you ever have any experiences where somebody got hurt? Because oh yeah. We, our security was a company of Arvin Rangers when we went out and they would have a platoon on either flank, one behind us and then one with us. And these Mine clearance is a slow process and you don't have, uh, it just doesn't move quickly. You know, and these guys are out on the flanks and they're walking along, they're walking along the same place every day. And uh, the VC would go out there and plant booby traps and things like this and uh, it, um, it, it cost them. If you lost your focus, it cost them. And we would find stuff on the road. We would find little notes, you know, stuck on sticks, written with Vietnamese writing. We'd send them back to uh, uh, or the the S2 to take a look and see if they were worthwhile. Never got any feedback. And there were always what I would call tests. One day we're walking around down the road and make this kind of bend, and there's a grenade laying on the road, and. Uh, yeah, and the first inclination is to pick it up and throw it. There's absolutely not. You know, somebody's watching what we're doing, and uh, so we got out there and picked it up and determined that it wasn't booby trap. Had somebody blow it up, you know, and he wanted to know why you didn't pull the pin, and I explained it to him, you know. And one day we're walking down there, and out of the corner of our eye, there's this boot, this jungle boot. It's the road is, uh, you know, a level surface here, and then it kind of fell away, and then it, what it was like a cut through the side of this hill. And there's this boot sitting there, and uh, you know that was one of the cardinal rules: you never left the road. And that boot just faded into the uh, the uh, the scenery. I mean, it, when nobody ever left the road, and for all I know, that boot's still sitting there. It was just. 
it was just tests. It was always a test. Yeah. And uh, I um, did that through May, and uh, I had been on the road from the middle of January through May, so uh, they were starting to get new lieutenants in, and uh, I got the word I was going back up to the company, back to Hill 37 to be the XO. And I thought, I'm off the road. <laughs> Hooray! So I, I did that. I went up there and uh, a memorable day. Uh, I was the XO and the battalion commander was down visiting. And uh, we were in the CO's office and the CO had a radio in his office where he could monitor the company net. And there's a scream, this just scream and garbled noise that came over the net, you know, and, and we're all looking at each other trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, the skipper said, you know, he thought somebody was playing a joke. Get off the net. And what it was, it was the radio man for the second platoon out on the road in Hollingsworth that the, the platoons rotated. Hollings, Sergeant Hollingsworth uh, was out on the road with a platoon and we had a marine platoon, they had a marine platoon for security. And the platoon leader walked out forward of the sweep team and came up on the road. And he went ahead of the sweepers to tell the guy to get off the road and detonated in a fairly large IED. And uh, I just remember the, the guy's voice saying, you know, Sergeant Hollingsworth just got blown up, you know, and then he'd, the platoon leader got on and kind of calmed him down and, and they got a medevac out there, but I mean, he was gone. There wasn't anything anybody could do for him. So that, that was a bummer. And that, that kind of closed out my tour at Delta Company. And then I went to Alpha Company, which was at Camp Love. So the Oak Club was there and I was the XO of A Company, which was boring. Oh, God, it was boring. I mean, uh, they had platoons that were out and doing stuff, but it was, you were in the battalion area, so everybody had to be spiffy and, you know, it just, yeah. The only the only upside was the club. I mean, you go to the club and have a beer, yeah. and uh, so you know I thought, well, that's okay. You know, I'm halfway through the tour. If this is the way I spend the other half, that's okay. And I think that was in uh, in May, and uh, I was there till August doing that, and uh, I get a phone call, get your gear together. You're going out to Bravo Company, okay. No explanation, just get your stuff together. So I, all right, and I get my stuff together and I go over to the S3's office and he said, you're going to Bravo this afternoon. And I, okay. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't think to ask why, I, I just, you're going to Bravo. Okay. So the driver picks me up and we're heading out. We're, we're on uh, the northeastern side of Da Nang, so we had to drive through Da Nang. Bravo Company was just off of Route 1 south of Da Nang. So we have to go through the city and get on Route 1 south. And we're driving through the city and it's, you know, I had to spend a lot of time in Da Nang, but it's the typical hustle and bustle you expect in a, in a, in a Vietnamese city. And as we're getting close to the south side of the city, I'm seeing a lot of people just moving my way. You know, and the driver and I are looking at each other wondering what's going on, because it looked like an evacuation. And uh, we just started to get a little apprehensive because we had no idea what was going on. And then I see this Marine come running by and he's shot. He shot in the arm. And I looked at the driver and he looks at me. And, and uh, it was. It was an evacuation. The, uh, the, v the NBA and the VC had come up into Da Nang. I think they called it the third offensive. And what they were trying to do was to take Da Nang, or at least take the radio station and the uh, um, the broadcast facilities for the area because the peace talk, they wanted to make an impression on the peace talks and they wanted to be, what they were hoping for was a general uprising. Uh, but I mean, I didn't know, the driver didn't know, we're just zipping along and fortunately we had to make, it was it was the Camley Bridge, The uh, they had taken the Camley Bridge and that battle was ongoing. We were fortunate enough to have to make a right turn off of that road and kind of went off on our way got the Bravo Company and big pucker factor because they were south of Da Nang and there was a, uh, an, an army artillery unit there, one of the big long guns, the 175s, and uh, 
So they were concerned. They thought they were for sure going to be a target. But it was a long night, but it, it uh, there wasn't any problem. You know, nobody got much sleep, but it was okay. But it didn't stop the business of route clearance. We had to get up the next day. I was the XO, so I wasn't going out on the road. Um, I don't remember what the reason was I went to Bravo. I don't think it had to do with the situation of the NBA. It had to do with the personnel issue. But there I was. I was the XO, and, and uh, so got the got the feel of the company and the lay of the land. And um, we had new officers, new lieutenants. I think we had three, two new lieutenants and two experienced lieutenants. So they, they used the same training philosophy. You work with one lieutenant. Lieutenant, you're a new guy, you work with a lieutenant who's more experienced, you get the hang of what's going on. And uh, about, after I'd been there about a week, um, we're sitting in the COC and the uh, radio call comes in that, you know, there had been a booby trap detonation and two officers were uh, wounded. So we, we had no idea what was going on. That's all we had. The medevacs were on their way, pulling these guys out. I think there was a, an enlisted Marine also. Right? There were a total of three wounded, I think. So the skipper's all upset. He has no idea who's hurt. The, the, the transmission just was not, it wasn't a well-organized report. So he said, come on. We jump in the Jeep. And we're south of Denang on, uh, on Route 1. So we go zipping up. He's trying to find the lieutenants to find out what happened. We went to Charlie Med, then we went to NSA, and they weren't at any of those locations. And uh, finally somebody said, oh, I think they went out to the hospital ship. So I don't remember whether it was the sanctuary or the repose, but somehow or other he wangled a ride out to the hospital ship and hmm. never did find the officers. I don't, they weren't killed, but I mean, they, they, we just couldn't find them. We didn't know where they were, but we found the enlisted guy who was injured, and he wasn't hurt that bad. And what had happened, there was a can or something, a package, lying on the road. And one of the lieutenants went over, it was probably the new guy, went over and picked it up to look at it. And the other guy comes over to see what he's doing. And as he turned it, a grenade fell out and detonated. Um, there were, they weren't KIAs, but they, they, actually, they both actually left the country. Yeah. And uh, were, it was serious enough for them to be evacuated. Mm -hmm. I was now a platoon leader again. I was out on the road. <laughs> and, you know, I thought, oh, man. I, this, this is August. Yeah, so it's, it's late August now, and I'm thinking, geez, I got, you know, it's, I got four months to go. And, uh, but, you know, it was a good platoon. We, it, the sweep was a lot different because we would drive 10, 15 kilometers south on Route 1 because Route 1 up near Da Dang was a hard surface road. So there really wasn't too much of a problem. We would have to go to where the road transitioned to broken up hardtop or just dirt. And that's what we did. I mean, we'd go way down south. And uh, we did it in a uh, really lonely feeling down there. It was, it was, there just wasn't a lot of activity. And, you know, you're down the road a piece. There weren't too many friendly locations. There were some CAC units or CAP units, you know, combined action platoon units. And uh, we were riding. One day, my platoon, which was, you know, like 12 guys again, I mean, we didn't have table of organization units, uh, were in the truck in the, uh, with this other platoon, another, uh, you know, 10 guys or so. They're doing the sweep. We're going to a place called Hoi An to uh, do a construction, some minor construction project for a Korean Marine outfit down there. And uh, we're in the truck, and it's it's miserable weather. It's raining. It's dark. Uh, nobody's got a poncho. You're sitting in your flag jacket, your helmet. You know, the water's running down. The other guy, the other platoon leader, had called shotgun. So I'm sitting in the back with my guys and what's left of his guys. We get to where they start the sweep. Those guys dismount, get out in front, and the, the truck driver is just kind of driving along behind them. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I can go up and sit in that seat. In the, you, did you ever get so uncomfortable you didn't want to move? Mm -hmm. And I, that's the way I felt. I was wet, I was cold, and I just stayed there. 
and then I remember there, it, it was a dark gray day, much like it is outside today. And then it got darker, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And I, it, was, it was like an out-of-body experience. I was up in the air, looking down in the bed of the truck, and these guys are settling down to the bed of the truck. And, it, it, and I realized we'd hit a mine, and uh, it blew the, the, the left front side of the truck off and uh, killed the driver and, and our corpsman had his legs damaged pretty badly. Uh, and unfortunately, he was the only corpsman there. Uh, but we were, we were very close to a combined action platoon that had a corpsman. And there were two Vietnamese Arvin uh, medics there who were, got down real quick and were able to help some of the guys. But uh, it was it, it was uh, it was a bad experience. We you know the driver died fairly shortly, and then uh, we had three emergency medevacs and a couple of routines to go with it. And then this truck. What are we going to do? We had to stay there until the truck. You know, some we could get a wrecker out there and get the truck out of the way. But it you know it it uh, it's it's difficult when you lose somebody you know like like you said. But the the platoon that was responsible for the sweep really felt bad because they had missed it, okay? So, I mean, there's... How badly were you hurt? I wasn't hurt. I, I wasn't hurt. I, uh, the, uh, those of us in the back of the truck were not hurt. How badly was the soldier fi uh, riding no. shotgun hurt? There wasn't anybody in the... Oh, it, no, the, wait, He I'm... had gotten out. The other lieutenant oh. had gotten out to do the sweep. So it was vacant. That's why I was thinking about time. going up there. Oh. And uh, the um, there was a guy with a machine gun on the. It was just an M60 laying on the, the canvas top of a five-ton truck, and he had his arm over it like this. And when it detonated, it came up and uh, caused a compound fracture to his arm. And it, we had a master sergeant with us who was the construction chief. He just went out of the truck and off into the paddy somewhere. And fortunately, he was okay. He was just dazed. And, and funny story, I had this huge knife. That being a second lieutenant, you know, bigger is better. I bought this knife, Randall fighting knife. And uh, I, I, I saw him in the paddy, so I went out there and I'm top, top, are you all right? And he's talking to me and he's conscious, you know, and I don't see any blood or anything. And I said, I'm going to take your flak jacket off. And I could not get the buttons off. I just, the, the snaps, I just couldn't get them unsnapped. So I pull out this knife and he said, I don't know what's good about this big. And he said, Lieutenant, please put the knife away. So, I mean, that was, that was the only light thing that day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, life went on and uh, uh, was, you know, platoon leader for the rest of my time there in, uh, in um, I guess, September. That was, that was the end of September, so in October uh, I got orders back into the battalion area and became the headquarters company commander. I think they felt, you know, the sands in my hourglass of luck were running out, so I, I got to go back to battalion and I was there for, till, for the remainder of the tour and uh, was primarily the guard officer, you know, headquarters company commander, you, you don't have anybody that works for you, it's just, yeah. I was responsible for camp security and, yeah. and stuff like that. So, almost got to see the Bob Hope show, almost. Right. It was coming to Da Nang and I was really fired up about going. And I forget what it was, the day it came, I mean, I knew I wasn't gonna be up close, I just wanted the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Something, something came up and I couldn't go, but you know, at that time I was, I had under a month to do. Yeah. You know, I was okay. Yeah. And go have a beer. <laughs> well, moving back in time a little bit, uh, you were in country in January of '68. So, how were you affected by Tet? That's the reason when I couldn't I couldn't drive down to Anwa because that area belonged to somebody other than the U.S. Marine Corps. And that was a result of the Tet. Of the Tet, the, the first in the initial Tet offensive. Okay. And then the second one, there was a second one, and then the third one was when we were heading out to Bravo Company. Okay. So it was, uh, it was kind of an exciting year. 
Well, what were your emotions as you were preparing to leave country? To come home? I was ready. I, uh, I actually wrote my wife a letter and said, I, I want to go buy a farm and just go sit in the woods, yeah. you know, and just not, not do anything. Just, you know, lead a quiet life. And uh, of course, I knew that was going to happen. I, I couldn't grow grass. <laughs> well, what did you do when you first got back? Um, I uh, got re reacquainted. I, I remember the plane landed. In, it's January in Philadelphia, and it's cold. And I'm just come from you know yeah. uh, Vietnam, and all I had on was my winter service greens. That time they didn't have uh, those things that come out. You just walk down the ladder or the the stairway. And my wife and my mother were there to greet me, and they just glommed on to me. And I am freezing. I just said, "Please, let's go in. I just yeah. got to go in and get warm." And then you know, just got got settled back into what it was like in the land of the big PX. And uh, we were fortunate because my orders sent me to Quantico, which was, you know a two hour ride, or three hour ride from Philadelphia at that time, so we could get home fairly frequently. And I, uh, I was, I was it, when I first got back, I was pretty sure I was going to get out and do something else. And uh, I, I really enjoyed, I worked in the maintenance department, I was one of the officers in one of the technical areas there. And I, uh, the people I, I knew, the people I worked with here were really great, and I really had some, I met some really fine people when I was in the country. So I thought about it and thought about it and uh, decided that I would stay. So I applied for a regular commission and augmented and stayed in the Marine Corps. How were you treated when you first got back by friends? I was, I was, oh, by friends. Well, by friends, family, yeah. or the general public that knew you went to Vietnam? I, I was kind of an oddity. Because you know that time in '68, they were, you were starting to see some nasty stuff on the news, yeah. and uh, people didn't know how to uh, how to talk to me. I mean, there wasn't any. I didn't didn't feel any differently. I mean, but they they were you know we're beginning to see in the media this this perception of the uh, the uh, uh, drug. Ravaged soldier, sailor, marine, whoever you know, and they, they everybody just kind of looked at you. You you carried uh, uh, the burden of of this perception of not somebody who's normal. In uh, after a while, I mean, you know, people could see who you are. It was okay. Um, I never had any direct confrontational experience with any protesters. Or mind you, we're at Quantico, which is. 40 miles south of D.C., uh, never wore my uniform, never, outside. I mean, we weren't allowed to, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, the demonstrations were going on at the Pentagon, and, and uh, we were hearing stories from guys up there. That, uh, if, even, out, even outside the gate at Quantico, you'd see these groups come down with beads and long hair and, and try to create an incident. and. Uh, you just had to be on your toes, so it, it uh, you were always on. Yeah. You know, you just had to always be on. Yeah. So you made a career of the Marines. I did. And, and how long were you in the Marines? Twenty-six years. Wow! Congratulations. Yeah, I, I, it was an adventure. I mean, uh, my wife and kids. Uh, it really was. It was an adventure. I don't. Uh, I don't think I would have done any. Well, I mean, everybody would do make some changes, but I, I think I would have stayed with that career choice. I, I stayed because of the people. I really enjoyed yeah. the people. Yeah. Uh, I know, and you know, I, the reason I'm doing this too is because of guys like uh, Hollingsworth and, and a couple other guys, uh, Sergeant Chapman, and some other people who, uh, you know, their names are on the wall, but. You can associate a face with them, and yeah. you know who they were. And, and uh, somebody needs to just mention their name once in a while, so they're not lost yeah. forever. So, yeah. well, that's such an honorable thing to do. Huh? Mm -hmm. I, I know they appreciate what you're doing. Well, thank you. Yeah. And what did you do after your military? 
Uh, I retired. Actually, my last duty station was down at Forces Command, uh, over by the, down by the airport, and I worked in the counter drug division. It was a joint tour, and uh, we provided military support to federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. Mm. We did the paperwork and found the stuff for them to use. And, and, uh, the, uh, the person in the Marine Corps who tells you where you're going next is called the Monitor. And I got a call from the Monitor who told me I was going to have the opportunity to go to Okinawa again. And I said, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I had, I, was, I had 26 years in, uh, and my family loved the area, and I did too. So we thought this, this is the right time. So I retired, and uh, fortunately, through a Marine Corps uh, acquaintance, was able to find a, a job at a chemical company up in Mar Marietta. And uh, so I worked there for another 15, 16 years, and uh, just recently became a professional retiree. Well, congratulations. <laughs> I like it. It's good <laughs> stuff. Would you take a couple of minutes and just tell us what impact your service had on your life and your experience in Vietnam had on your life and, and anything you'd like to say to future generations and just anything yeah. you'd like to say just in general. I, I actually grew up in the Marine Corps. I, I consider myself very fortunate. I worked for some really fine people. I worked with some really fine people. Um, what, I, what I learned about life in Vietnam because it didn't, it doesn't always go your way, and there's sometimes you just can't do anything about it. You just got to motor on through and get done what's got to be done. Um, but it's the people. I mean, it always has been the people. That's been the draw for me. I mean, that's why I'm, I'm involved in the veterans' activities that I am today. Is because when I worked at the civilian position, I, I'd always missed. The camaraderie and, and the type of people that you meet in the service, and I had made a vow to myself that one day I would try to reconnect some way with that kind of people. And uh, you know, I I, th I think the military gets a bad rap, maybe not so much now as it did in the last 20, 30 years. But uh, I mean, you and I have both both worked at the USO, and we see those young people. Uh, and they're amazing. I mean, I, I just, if people, if the American public, I don't think the American public appreciates the quality of the young people that are serving today in whatever branch of service they are. They are truly, I believe, the, the cream of the crop and, and the future of the country. So, uh, you know, I would say don't just dismiss service out of hand. Uh, it's it's an experience that uh, it's a rewarding experience that you never forget. Well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate. Number one, what you've done for your country. I mean, you're you're a great example of a true military professional. Yeah. And uh, it was an adventure. Yeah. And uh, you're thank you for coming in and telling your story. And it's an honor to have been able to, well, thank to you. interview. Okay.